In 2021, Disney realised they owned Home Alone and decided to bring the franchise back with a modern spin that takes place in the original movie's universe. We're not going into Home Sweet Home Alone with much faith, but it has to be better than the last couple. Merry Christmas everyone, welcome to the Collector's Cut. I am Peter and joining me as always and the Christmas spirit is David. Shame on you. This is my life choice. <laughs> I just want to point out that, you know, when we did Home Alone 1, I was wearing a Santa hat and I had a red jumper on the entire review. Home Alone 2, I was feeling a bit too warm, so I just went with a Santa hat. Home Alone mm -hmm. 3, started with a Santa hat, threw it off in anger somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Did the same with Home Alone 4. Home mm -hmm. Alone 5, I had the Santa hat on for maybe... 10 minutes, threw it away. Not even, yeah. This movie, and I'm not saying it's the worst one, but I'm not even bothering to start with a Santa hat. I'm just showing you the decline in my mental state and my Christmas spirit over the course of this franchise. That's right. You know what my favorite part about this movie was? Is that <laughs> this must be the point where they're going to realize once again that they need to wait another 10 years before they try it again. And by that point, this show will most likely be over and it won't be my problem anymore. Oh no, I've, I've got plans for this show 10 years out of the future, so yeah. buckle up. Uh, can't wait for the 2034 continuation of Home Alone. <laughs> That's funny though, because Home Alone 5 was about a decade after 4, and then this was mm -hmm. almost a decade later. This was 9 yep. years after Home Alone uh, 5. So, yes, going with decade, it should be 2031 would be great when the next one is. Excitement. Yeah. Can't wait. So we'll start spoiler free, of course. We're here to talk about Home Sweet Home Alone, otherwise referred to as Home Alone 6, which is what it is. So, otherwise referred to as the Disney Plus one. The Disney Plus one, yes. But there were some interesting things going into this one. The kid uh, who plays Max, the the, the main mm -hmm. kid in the movie, he was in Jojo Rabbit, and he was very good in that. You know, he was, was a very kind of witty character, very well written, of course. That mm -hmm. was a big help. Uh, uh, you know, Tika Waititi can be a little hit and miss, but I think that's his best movie, and I think his direction of, of the kid was very good. And so he had that going. Ellie Kemper is one of the yeah. the adults in this. You know, people know her from things. I recognize mm -hmm. the dad from stuff too. I don't I don't know his name, but like he, uh, Rob Delaney. Yeah, he's he's just a stand up comedian in general, but he has been in a few things. Uh, apparently, Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning Part One. He was in. I don't know how big of a role, but he was there. I mean, I saw that, and I don't remember who he was in it, so that's... Guess it wasn't a big role. That's, uh, yeah, well, hey. Hey, we'll be doing all those when the next one's coming out in a couple of years, yes. so uh, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll see what it was when the time comes. But, uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about Home Sweet Home Alone. Uh, the premise... Uh, so, I guess, I guess, yeah, okay, so we're in a spoiler-free, right, but I'll just, to give the bit of the premise, and what makes this movie actually a little bit different to the others is that the the quote-unquote villains of this movie aren't actually villains. They are sympathetic yep. characters. They are a married couple who are about to lose their home, and it's actually the kid who has seemingly done something bad and stolen something that's worth a lot of money that would help them save their house. And that's mm -hmm. why they want to get the thing back. So there's a lot more misunderstandings in this one versus like actual nefarious villains who are like oh we're gonna get that kid and strangle him kind of vibes yeah that's kind of what i was wondering because i did look this up beforehand at least the cast not the uh plot itself but i was looking and saw you know based off of last names that ellie kemper and rob delaney must have been the equivalent of the bandits and my immediate thought was how are they gonna turn these fairly likable actors into bandits basically how are they going to make them the villains of these of this movie and in the end it turns out they just didn't no. they did not make them the villains which to be fair i think if you're going to do something different for a new home alone movie given as sympathetic uh i don't know thieves i guess we'll call them yeah uh is an interesting spin on the formula at least on mm -hmm. paper like i don't i don't hate the idea of it i think what it does to this movie, though, is that they they get so much screen time because we they're to be honest they're kind of the main characters, and the right. kid is is a secondary character to the point where, and again we won't get into it too much yet. We're not in spoilers, but there's a scene roughly in the middle of this movie where 
we've had like one montage of the kid being home alone and he talks to someone else and he's basically saying how he misses his mum and dad he's like oh it was great being alone for like an hour but you know what i'm kind of missing them now and i want my mum and dad back for christmas and i went wait a minute we have spent no time with you and we're already at the point kevin was at in the first movie right before the the third act kicked in and it just it felt really like we've not bonded with you at all and that's a big yeah. part problem with this movie, I think. It is. I mean, the, going back to what I was saying about previous movies, we had, I think number three was, okay, if you don't like the Christmas spot side of things, but you like the traps, go with that one. If you like the Christmas side, but hate the traps, go with number four. And there was always <laughs> something that was like missing from different movies. This one is, if you like the Christmas and the traps, but hate that it's a kid doing it. <laughs> this is the one for you. Which I didn't think was a possibility going into it, that you could remove the kid from Home Alone, but hey, they yeah. somehow managed to pull it off. Well, not remove, but just... No. He's more of the afterthought of the movie. as Decentralized, yeah. yes. It's, it's, a, it's a wild different spin, and I kind of respect it for doing that. However, just to get into general thoughts, like very quickly in the mm. first 10 minutes, a lot of the comedy was not landing for me. It was coming off quite yeah. lame. And I, I will, you know, I'll, this is a minor, minor little tinky winky spoiler, right? Just a little tinky winky. It's a little reference to the past movies I want to bring up now because the, 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 uh, the larger okay. thing I want to complain about that I'll say spoiler free relates to it, right? So okay. early on, you see a sign outside a house that says McAllister Home Security, and it's got the Home Alone logo. And I thought to myself, you know what? That's actually a cute little reference just to suggest what Kevin grew up to be. He's doing Home Mm -hmm. Security. That's quite funny. That's a good little visual gag. Great. That's a nice little reference. Yep. I'm glad they kept it at just that. But no, of course, this is a Disney-produced movie in the year 2021, which means that not 20 minutes later, I won't say what any of it is, but there is nostalgia wanking happening very, very aggressively. We have to do more on the nose references. We have to quote yeah. things. We have to do all these stupid things. It goes full nostalgia, and it's a real shame because I thought the one positive thing I had early on was, that, hey, that was a nice reference to the first one. Leave it there. We're good. Nope, yeah. couldn't do it. They just couldn't do it. Uh yeah <laughs> another thing just to, another broad thing i'll complain about is this is the first one in a while that's actually used a lot of the music from the original yes. a lot of the themes which is nice however I'm I'm, I'm I'm just gonna say up front it had to have been rights issues because this is the first movie they made post acquiring of 20th century it had to be a rights issue i i don't know how they could manage to do home alone and not have the song be like carried over rights wise but the fact that they used it so much in this movie it had to have been that they've just been unable to use it i'm not no i'm not convinced because plenty of franchises that are made by the same studio just Mm -hmm. do not use the music for several sequels and then go back to doing it later this happens time and time again across hollywood so i am not convinced i don't think that proves a goddamn thing i don't think it proves it but i think it is a big piece I, no. of evidence that's pointing in that direction no i don't think it is i think this movie wants the nostalgia this is the full nostalgia oh, yeah. sequel so it makes sense that they wanted to use the music but that's not the complaint i have the complaint i have is that a lot of the pieces of music they use are played at very weird times that mm. are the wrong <sighs> so for example the moment where the kid max realizes that he's home alone is where they play now that, this one's a bit of a remix actually but they play like mm. more traditional versions later but they play effectively a remix of the main theme the, the the lullaby sounding main theme yeah somewhere in my memory and all i could think was but this is the heartfelt theme where you that you do when you know the kevin at the end of the movie is reunited with his mother you know mm-hmm. the music that actually plays in home alone when he thinks he's alone is this little hijinks it's like oh he's up to no yeah. good this is this is not a good thing in the grand scheme of things but here they play this sweet music and i'm like this is weird it's not supposed to have this feeling at this point in the movie uh mm-hmm. it just it, it came off wrong uh you know similar they did even do the full choir version at one point and that felt like kind of a weird moment for that i get contextually why but it still felt a bit weird given the larger yeah. scope of I the mean- movie even without just the music, I think this movie had a major tone problem the whole way through mm. in that it doesn't feel like 
because both sides of this, the kid being left home alone and the quote unquote bandits are both focusing on, you know, the true meaning of Christmas and family and stuff like that, but they still have to somehow make a conflict happen. It goes from heartfelt to wacky zany in like the weirdest transitionary yeah, well, patterns. That's what I was saying earlier. It's all about misunderstandings and like yeah. misheard things and all that. Um, and it does create a problem where I could see kind of a version of this maybe working with a much smarter script, but mm -hmm. the the first problem up front is that, well, yet again, there's very little stakes in this because the entire time we know that these people that are coming out of the house are not bad people and are never going to hurt them. So yeah. there's something to be said. As goofy as they were at times, there's something to be said for having the bandits, you know, the sticky slash wet bandits who... Mm -hmm. you know, were actual villains and it gave, you know, some stakes, you know, relative to it to being a family movie, which is actually another thing that kind of caught me off guard. And this is there's not too many of them, but there's one or two just slightly more crash jokes in this one that I thought were a bit out of place. Yeah. Uh, like, and that's not to say that there wasn't jokes that kind of, like, Home Alone 2, the whole thing in the hotel where they're like, hey, uh, get on your knees and tell me you love me. You've been smooching with everyone, including Frank, the security guard or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. There's kind of like some sexual implications there. But there's a joke in this early on where someone Im implies that someone's just been looking at someone's underwear drawer like a pervert. And, I, and right. it just kind of felt like, that doesn't feel like it belongs in this movie, that little joke. No. but it's And that happened, like you said, it happens a few times throughout this where they, it's obviously nothing too non-kid friendly it's yeah. the sort of thing that could fly over a kid's head and they wouldn't understand why it's, it's not um, yeah it it's, a, it's a handful of times but it's it just every time it happened i was like hmm that's an interesting yeah. choice uh so I, that, there was, that's there was one point where the kid whose name is max by the way i'm not even sure if we said that um max is he, you know he's home alone he gets on the computer and he's like all right internet do your worst and then it comes up with the parental block and i'm like I I see the joke, I get it, but I also feel like if they didn't have the YouTube logo there, I fully expected to see like the Pornhub logo there. You know? <laughs> like it seems like it was that kind of joke that was building up to it. I mean, he's maybe a touch young for that joke. I'm just saying, the it, it was one of those things where it's because of the tone problem, because of how all of this stuff was building on itself of like is it going for wacky zany? Is it going for misunderstandings? Is it going for heartfelt? I didn't know what to expect from any scenes. Anytime a new scene started, I didn't know whether or not it was going to be a scene where I'm supposed to say like, oh no, you, like you were saying, there's one point uh, like 20 minutes in where he's already talked about missing his parents. I, did, I couldn't tell if that was supposed to be heartfelt or if we were leaning into the wacky zany side of things because it just kept bouncing back and forth. Yeah, it... I think we we have some traps that are... I mean, the trap section is probably the most fun the movie gets, just because mm -hmm. at least a few of them are kind of funny. Um, there's one or two okay moments there. But there are mm -hmm. also some traps that are... It, it kind of goes away from the... Because some of the previous like late sequels had traps that were so elaborate, it felt like, no, this is ridiculous to any kid. Like They, they want me to believe a kid set this up. This yeah. sort of goes away from that, but there's one or two where it's just really hard to believe, um, like, I'll just say, it, like, at one point, the, the dad character, right, what, 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 it's mm -hmm. like Jeff, right, Jeff, mm -hmm. he falls for something that feels like no human being, like, should ever fall for, and there's just, like, there's, there's a couple of disbelief moments, because I will say this, right, there is one element of suspension of disbelief that I was getting into this movie, or at least once I got what the premise was early on, I was like, okay, mm -hmm. there's one bit of disbelief that I will give you, movie, you, that you get because it, the, the premise of the movie relies on it, is it's the idea that the, this, like, nice couple are going to be willing to break into a house, right? Yeah. If these were more realistic characters, or if this was a more grounded movie, I would never buy that. But you know what? This is a fun family Home Alone movie. I will grant you that suspension of disbelief and give you that one for free. But everything yeah. else beyond that, you have to set up, you have to earn, you have to give me the, the proper, you know, outcomes and whatnot for. Mm -hmm. And I, I think when it was getting to some of the traps, it was really like mixing in ones that kind of worked with some that were 
just too absurd to believe that anyone would ever not notice or fall for or yeah. whatever. So I don't want to get into specifics also until spoilers, a, but yeah, there's also a few in there that I, it's not even down to believability on the characters' part. It's believability just in terms of physics and how things work. Yeah, physics are a bit wonky, and there was a couple of times where I wasn't sure if like because what one of the things was even if you could question how believable a trap was in the first couple of movies. The mm-hmm. trap happening was always a stunt man doing a physical stunt where you could tell someone did that fall or did that hit or right. did whatever. Here's a couple where I'm like, I'm pretty sure it switched to CG or something for like a couple seconds oh, while yeah. it was going through the beats of a of a trap. And I think mm-hmm. that takes you out of it because much like any action sequence, if you have a CG character being the one who takes the, the pain in the middle, it makes it less funny. Because now it's just yeah, a sad, I- sad effect. But even then, I, I don't even think it's always when it switches to a CG character. There's two stunts in particular, which we'll get to, that the trap itself, the thing that's supposed to be causing them pain, is very clearly CGI, mm. because either it'd be infeasible or it's just obvious that it is CGI. And that's not... For me, that then just screams they're running around like and just randomly blocking things, and they're just like, CGI is just showing up wherever it needs to be, you know? Yeah. It just, it screams to me that none of this is, none of this has any stakes in my mind because I can immediately see, like, it's fake. And it's, I understand that that's not, you know, suspension disbelief. You're supposed to be like, oh, no, there there aren't real dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. Yeah. A lot of that's effects. But, like, it's still something where it's taking me but out of I, it I think because it's just so obviously fake. The traps in Home Alone, though, effectively are slapstick, right? That's yeah. the type of comedy they are. And slapstick relies on an element of truth to it. And the truth isn't, of course, the believability of the traps. The truth is, oh, you see, it may not really be Daniel Stern who's, you know, slipping and falling on his neck or his arse or whatever, but Mm -hmm. there's a stuntman doing it. And it's seeing that actually play out that makes it funny. And when you take that away, like, obviously you understand why you're not doing a practical T-Rex in Jurassic Park. You accept that. And you sort of like, okay, they have to use these. But, you know, there's a reason why people constantly talk about this practical versus CG or even, I, I saw a, a great video on YouTube about how, like, a lot of things actually do have a lot of CG that we don't notice, but the reason mm. why we don't notice is because there's a healthy mix of CG and practical, and that gets the best results. So even if there is CG, they've got a good reference for, uh, yeah. you know, like Top Gun Maverick, you know, there's CG, like, people keep saying, oh, they really went up and shot, you know, the actors in the planes flying around. And they did shoot a lot of real planes, but they replaced them all with CG. There's still CG in the movie. But they yeah. look really good because they got real footage and they know how it would react to the light and all you know all mm-hmm. these other things. But anyway, the, the, but people always talk about how you get pulled out of certain types of things, certain types of scenes. You know, when I watch a horror movie, when I see CG blood spattering all over the place, it takes me out of it because it's not as fun right. as that. And I know why they do it. It's, hell, we just did David Fincher season. David Fincher uses CG blood in pretty much all of his movies now. And the yeah. reason is, is because they can do... 25 takes without having to clean up the set or clean up the actor because the blood's just going to be added later and i get Mm -hmm. that and maybe because he's not making splatter movies it's not a big deal that he does it in one or two scenes but when i'm watching a movie that's like afraid of the 13th or something and i'm there to see like limbs being chopped off and blood spurting around when that's cg it just takes away from the fun and i think the same is true for home alone traps as bizarre as it sounds i think that comparison actually works Mm mm-hmm so yeah no I, I agree i think that it is an issue of some things just need to be done real there's nothing that's it's not something where it's you know purism it's not something where it's saying oh you know only real films can use practical effects and whatnot or you have to do this or else you're just schlock like no it is just a matter of certain things require it to actually be happening for it to land yeah um i think another issue i've had with most of the sequels after two and I think it's still somewhat true in this one, even though it's better than the last couple in terms of this, but is that the momentum building up to the, okay, it's time to start setting up the traps and like, well, we feel that the stakes are rising and that's why he has to do this. Mm-hmm. That feels somewhat like luster here to me. It's not quite as terrible as the last couple, but I still feel that, you know, like, you know, so, I mean, uh, we said it uses some of the music here. It uses the, the trap montage music. It uses the, okay, it's time right. to set up the traps music. When that music kicks in in this movie, it kind of felt a little bit, eh, are we there? I don't know if it yeah. feels like we're there, but okay. 
I mean, I think for me, it all comes back down to the idea that this movie doesn't have a villain and all of it relies on misunderstanding. So in the first movie, when it came time of, OK, we're going to come back here at eight o'clock and then we're going to hit up this house. You had a deadline and you had clear reasons as to why it is he needed to set these traps. But in this movie, because we're following around this couple that's just trying to get this MacGuffin back. All this could just be resolved if he just opened the door and said, hey, what do you want? <laughs> and so it doesn't feel like there's the requirement for uh, the I mean, trap scene. It does, to, to, to play the devil's advocate, it does do a couple of things to make you, to explain why he doesn't just open the door right. and say hello. It does give you reasons why he's scared of them or why he thinks they're up to something specific. And mm -hmm. that's fair enough. It's just none of it is as good as any of the reasons in the original movie as to why Kevin right. feels that he's on his own. Um, uh, there is one thing to set up here, though. I, I did kind of appreciate the reason why this kid doesn't just go to the... He kind of actually does call the cops briefly, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about mm -hmm. that when we get spoilers. But he decides not to involve the police again. And the reason for it that they give here, I actually thought was a nice little idea, is that he it occurs to him that his mother and father may get into trouble for leaving him home alone and he doesn't want them to be taken away to jail. And I thought, yeah. you know what? It's a reason for a kid to not get the authorities involved thinking that he's protecting his parents from legal recourse for being awful mm -hmm. is actually not a terrible reason. <laughs> yeah, it goes back to what I was saying in the last review of I feel like there was this kind of shift between how acceptable it is mm. for a parent to leave their child home alone from the late 80s, early 90s to now. And I think this movie just fully pushes that to the point where now they're making it work for the movie, where it's like, yeah, it is unacceptable nowadays. And we're going to use that as a plot point. Yeah. Like, we're oh, going to make fair, that a reason as to why he's not calling police. To be fair, his uncle, uh, when this all, when it all comes up that he's been left home mm -hmm. alone, he basically just goes, ah, it's first world problems, isn't it? And part of me was yeah. like, yeah, he'll probably be fine. He's got internet. He's got food in the fridge. <laughs> he'll, he'll, be, he'll be good. <laughs> yeah. I do also like uh, one of the major plot points they set up here is that they can't call the house because nobody has a landline and this kid doesn't have a cell phone. So that's just, it's, it's again, taking a it modern feels plausible. thing. plausible. Yeah. Exactly. That feels yeah, plausible I mean, today. Yeah. I can, I can easily say if someone tried to call my house, tough like there is no phone line here i don't think i've seen a jack for it anywhere in my entire house but that's just because of how they're built now so yeah i i think that it's a thing where they take the modern setting and they make it work for it and i think that it does a good job at that to a point to a point because yeah. at a certain point though like you were saying this movie is nowhere near as tight as the first two. No. It does not cover all of its bases. It leaves huge gaping reasons as to why doesn't he just do this? And they don't bother to explain it. No. So, so I think we'll, we're pretty much ready to go at the spoilers and work through the movie. I think can talk mm -hmm. about everything. Um, it's, I think the big thing is that it's lacking. And I know it's made for Disney Plus, but that's not an excuse because no. there's no reason why a movie shouldn't still look and feel like a movie. And I think there's a big difference. If you watch just the, the first few minutes of Home Alone 1 and then you watch the first few minutes of this, you're going to look at it and go, you know, the first one's a movie. And this one mm -hmm. feels like something that was made for a streaming service. And that's that's not specific to this movie. That's a broad problem that a lot of streaming, you know, quote unquote, content is, uh, yes. is having. But <laughs> uh, it's worth pointing out here. Uh, that said, the production quality and the like, just the cast that it has, like, it is absolutely, objectively, at least better than the last two. There's no oh, yeah. denying that. I mean, just uh, we didn't really go that deep into the cast outside of Ellie Kemper and Rob Delaney. Well, like, to be honest, like it's them two, and then it's Max, the kid that they're going after. Like that's the right. that's the only ones that really matter in the grand but scheme of things. But all of the backup plot or all the backup cast here, in terms of adults, they're all comedians. Every mm. single one of them is has a comedy background. And I think that was a good idea on the part of Disney because they realized, like, yeah, this is slapstick. This is comedy. It isn't something where we are, like, focusing on just the highest quality actors. We're focusing on people who can be funny. It's and just, I think that it works for some of them. Yeah, it's just a shame that I think a lot of the jokes just aren't that good. So even right. you've got Keenan Thompson early on as kind of a minor character and Almost mm. every joke involving him, it was just landing with a thud with me. Uh, yeah. I just wasn't feeling it at all. 
But uh, we'll, we'll get into everything and uh, talk about the, yep. the stuff. Um, so, anyway, actually, now that I'm thinking... No, okay. I'll just double-check it's done. Yeah. All right, spoilers. Okay. Spoilers sure. for Home Sweet Home Alone, everyone. Uh, All right. You have been warned. Uh, so... I actually did laugh really, like, I, I wouldn't say super hard. It wasn't like I was cackling and, like, to, like holding my sides or anything. But there mm. was that one genuine laugh right towards the end of the movie. Oh, okay. Right. We're skipping to the end. All I'm, right. I, 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 you know, I'm, just, I'm not going to say what it is yet. I'm just, I'm just, that's a, it's a tease. It's a tease to stick okay. around. All and right. I'll tell you All what right. actually made me laugh at the end. <laughs> my favorite thing was after we say the Patreon stuff. <laughs> Uh, do you know what? I keep meaning to like do a little bit of the Patreon plug in my intro, and I keep forgetting mm. to do it. Yeah, I want to try and like work it into my my routine of being like, "Hey, everyone, welcome to the show." And then before we get started, I'll just say you can mm. support us on Patreon and get some bonuses. Just a quick version of it before we get you, going. You got to work it in like all the other YouTubers, where like you'll start a sentence and say, "But if they really cared about that, they join the Patreon." Like, and then you just seamlessly work it into your speech. That's a douchey thing to say, though. It I'm, is, I'm not going to do that's that. that's why no, they do it. I'm not going to do that. I have uh, class and integrity. Yeah. <laughs> Thank wow. you very much. I didn't know. All right. <sighs> you shut your face. <laughs> you grim one. Anyway, what yeah. happened in this movie, Pete? Okay, so... <laughs> the movie starts off with our... Our main fa- this is the, the crazy thing about this movie, is that the quote-unquote main family is not the family with the kid who's home alone. <laughs> yeah. But it really doesn't, f- it really feels that way. So you've got Ellie Kemper playing Pam, and you've got Rob Delaney playing Jeff, and they're this married couple, and they're, they're having an open house at the start of the movie, and they're entertaining people. Uh, Keenan Thompson is the, the real estate agent, and they're talking mm-hmm. to a young hipster couple <laughs> who are thinking Just, of like, buying the house. up. Straight up millennials who like look like they go organic shopping and all that stuff. Yes. Um, and what was so weird about this is that uh, Ellie Kemper, or Pam, I should say, in the scene, mm. right? Jeff keeps kind of messing it up because he keeps kind of like bringing up negatives. Like, because they say, oh, we want to knock down some walls and make it a big open floor space, you know, that's modern architecture, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, mm-hmm. yeah, but if it's a load bearing wall, like, the whole thing will come crumbling down. And then both the wife and Keenan are like, why are you saying things like that? This house is sturdy. <laughs> You're trying to sell the house, Jeff. Right? And it's okay. And none of this was very funny. Like, I'm laughing more saying it than I was <laughs> as I was oh, watching yeah. it. Because, Absolutely. You know, but there's a, there's a silly little joke here where Pam says something is lit. And the reaction of the two young millennial hipsters is to sort of go, aww. Like, like that was cute that she tried to say something that she thinks oh, yeah. we say. Right, like, oh, look at you, you're precious. But what I thought was weird about that is that there's a running gag after this for the rest of the movie that Pam doesn't get like basic acronyms that young people know. Like, mm. at one point, the husband says later on, Oh, we really need a W, and she's like, W, a win, honey. Oh, yeah, yeah, we need a W, and I'm like, But you're the one who said let early on. <laughs> like, what? She just repeats what she hears on Fox News, Pete. <laughs> Apparently. Is that level? Uh, so, anyway, they're, they're doing the open house. And the mm. thing that gets the plot going is that driving, meanwhile, uh, nearby is Max, who's in the passenger seat, obviously, with his mum, Carol, who is mm-hmm. kind of a relatively main character. And he is bursting for a piss. Yep. He can't hold it. He needs to go. And she sees the sign for the open house and goes, aha, this is an idea. We can just go in and use their bathroom (laughs) and we can pretend that we're looking for a house. So that's what they do. And we get probably, like, I I don't think the movie was quite as bad as I was fearing during this scene, but the scene Mm -hmm. where Max and Jeff, like, like, interact for, like, two minutes on their own, where... There's like awkward back and yeah. forth. Really made like I was really worried about the rest of this movie during that. It's not good, but this scene was making me think we were going to have something even worse than five. It's it's because the entire scene is built around awkward humor, where you're just meant to be uncomfortable like the whole time. And I was, but not in the <laughs> way the movie wanted me to be. And the important detail here uh, is that there's a box of dolls, right? And Mm. Max makes fun of Jeff when Jeff says, they're not mine, they belong to my mother. She collected them. And he's like, yeah, sure they were, 
right? And Max has got an English accent, and so does his mum. Uh, worth pointing out. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because later on they talk, they call him Harry Potter, they call him a Lamy, they call him whatever. There's all, yeah. all these things. But one of these dolls has got an upside down head, and he points out and says, "Why is this upside down? That's weird." And he's like, "Don't touch it. it Maybe worth something." And this is very important because after this scene, when Jeff looks up the value of this doll on the internet, and this is after we establish that they've got financial issues. That they don't really want mm. to sell their house, but they have to because he lost his job a couple of months ago and they're they're getting by on just her salary and they've got two kids, blah, 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 blah. Yep. But he looks up what this thing's worth. And currently there's one on eBay for two hundred thousand dollars. And he's like, mm-hmm. Holy shit. That that'll like buy his time. We can keep the house for like, you know, however long that covers at least several months. I mean, of they, mortgage. It's enough to pay off their mortgage mortgage, they said. Yeah. So yeah, they can completely own the house at that point. So he goes looking for it and can't find it and his assumption of course is that the kid took it that this max mm. out of revenge because he wanted this big can of uh an energy drink or something and he's like ah no nah, mm. you shouldn't have that because you know it's really sugary You're, it's, that's up to your parents uh to the point where jeff rubs it in his face because he decides he doesn't like this kid by the end of the scene so he, t- yeah. he opens one in front of the mum and starts just going oh that's so good as he walks off out of the scene <laughs> I mean, in fairness, the reason that he decides he doesn't like the kid is that both the kid and the mom are like, oh, he kind of looks like Frankenstein. And then Jeff has to clarify, it's like, that's actually the uh, the scientist, not the monster. And then the mom comes up and just be like, oh, don't be silly, honey. He doesn't look like Frankenstein. Looks like Frankenstein's monster. Yes. There's a lot of body shaming of Jeff in this movie. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of body shaming of Max as well. Because of, <laughs> beca- because of the fact that this... Um, toy they all label as just an ugly little boy doll they because of the misunderstanding later on max believes that they're talking about him when they say ugly little boy and he just internalizes that the whole movie (laughs) he's got some issues max has got some psychological issues he has to work through there's no denying that so yeah so from here you're like okay the movies they kind of diverge a little bit and Mm -hmm. We set up the whole Max family, which is he has the house with those tons of cousins running around. Can I just say that this yeah. made me appreciate how well like constructed those scenes were at the start of Home Alone 1 and 2 are, mm-hmm. because this was actually annoying and I couldn't hear like half the dialogue because they were shouting over each other and it was like, mm-hmm. this, this, this was just like, like hey, you didn't realize how much skill they took or how much skill they had and how careful they were to arrange those scenes in Home Alone 1 because they were very pleasant to watch. You got the sense of chaos, but you always understood everything you needed yeah. to hear, so on and so on. And you watch this and you're like, oh, this is, ah, uh, like, ah. Uh, like it, it takes an extremely skilled hand to manufacture chaos, mm-hmm. to, make, to make chaotic things show up on screen in a way that you can understand. This just felt like, now we're going to put like four comedians and a bunch of kids in a house and then just tell them to run around. But and that's there's all it's going to be foreshadowing because someone steps in some Lego and says and how the whole painful scene it is. is nothing but foreshadowing because all they do is show all these kids oh, yeah. running around with their toys. And it's like, oh, hey, I wonder how many of these toys we're going to use in the final act. The answer is all of them. Yes. Every single one. Oh, I couldn't wait to see how the VR headset came into it. And I will. Mm-hmm. I've got thoughts on that when we get to it later. Uh, as long as we're talking about the VR headset, no, can no. we talk about the sister for a second? Oh, oh, yeah, this was one of those weird lines of dialogue that uh, stuck out yeah. as being a bit weird to me. Yeah, so the sister only has one line in this entire movie, but I guess <laughs> it's to show that she is not just another cousin in this home, she is the sister. Yes. And as Max turns the corner, accidentally bumps into her as she's wearing a VR headset. She rips it off and says, don't touch me, you perv. I'm your sister. (laughs) And I'm like, that seems a bit harsh to just come out the gate with, sis, but all right. Yeah, you given what she said, you think he walked past and slapped her on the ass. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) He bumped into her with his shoulder. It it was the most innocent. I mean, he was maybe being careless, but other than Mm -hmm. that, it was the most innocent thing ever. And then the other thing that in this scene drove me crazy, not in the oh. moment, but just for the movie as a whole, is they set up the Legos because Max's dad steps on them. And he steps on it. He says, Max, clean up your Legos. And Max says, okay, dad. 
And then for all I can tell, the dad died in between because he's just gone from this movie. Oh, the no, father no. never makes another appearance. He, he, Well, I've got a theory where he is in one scene in the middle, but he is at the okay. very end. He's at the epilogue. He is there at the dinner is table. Is he? Yeah. I missed him entirely. No, he's there. He's, there. He's, the, he's at the other end of the table. He's sitting opposite uh, Jeff at, right. in the epilogue. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, you remember the uncle more because the uncle's the one with the silly lines that's complaining yeah. about the kid or saying that it's not a big a deal. He's the he's one played who, by a comedian that I actually know, Pete Holmes. Yeah, he, he's been around. He's the one who wants the giant Toblerone, and then when you see them in Japan later, he's got a bag with like big giant Toblerone, which is a bit product placement, obviously, but it was a mm. slightly amusing payoff to the fact that he said, "Hey, you can get these giant bars of Toblerone." Oh, there he is with Toblerone bars at the size of a baseball bat. Very good. Yeah. Anyway, so the the key detail here, though, is the mum's on the phone arguing with the, the airline because she's mm-hmm. upset that they've split up the family over different flights, and she's mad that she's on a different flight from everyone else. And this is the key thing that's going to set up the Home Alone part of the movie, right? The first movie, of course, went into a lot of intricacies about how, you know, the, where the ticket goes, how they miscount someone, all these little details that sort of build up to he's not with them on the plane. Yep. This sets up this thing where they're taking two different planes, and the first plane is seemingly just her on her own, and she's upset that she's been put on a different plane from her kids, understandably. And what happens then is, is Max, because he wants peace and quiet, effectively, goes to the garage, goes into his parents' car, and watches some cartoons, and falls asleep in the car. And the next day, when the rest of the family are leaving to go to the airport, the mum's flight was hours ago, she's already gone, and they're mm-hmm. supposed to be taking Max with them, but they just assume that Max went with her because they can't see him. Right. Which, okay, you've done something to explain it, but I will say the idea that the father didn't know which flight his son was meant to be on because he's with the rest, of, he's with this group, Yeah, is absurd. That's, mm-hmm. that's the absurd part of this. I, again, it just comes down to the idea that it's not, as tightly written obviously they made a good faith effort they went into it and said all right we're we've made all these explanations we've said mm-hmm. the reason why you know he was out in the garage that's why he didn't wake up when uh the uncle was calling saying is you know is everyone out in the car they made a good faith effort but looking back at one and two they are so tight they they do not let any sort of excuse go by and obviously that was intentional because it is something as bad as leaving your child home alone on a vacation you need it to be that tight to make it work yeah i mean to be fair i also think that the uncles and aunties should have also been completely aware and had an ironclad down which kids were on which flight it feels absurd mm-hmm. that all the adults didn't all sit down and talk about this but the yeah. father, at the very least, should have known exactly which flights all of his kids were meant to be on. And mm-hmm. if anything, the thing that's missing from this movie is that when they realize in Japan that Max has been left behind, the fact that I th- I think the father, because I'll just talk about this scene just now, the father, I think, is in the toilet the whole scene. They, they reference someone shitting. They said that was, I think they said that was Uncle Stu. Was that Uncle Stu? Okay, I don't yeah. know who the father is then, but the, yeah. <laughs> fair enough. I don't know where he is in this scene then. But the, the idea that the mum isn't trying to strangle her husband because it's his fault, because it is his fault. Like, he's the one mm-hmm. responsible for his kid, right? Yeah. <laughs> there is no two ways about that. Unless I'm missing a detail here, I don't understand why the dad, uh, like, unless the dad did come with her, which is weird. Uh, the- I mean, it. they did say when she was on the phone that she was split up from her kids, and they are on two separate flights, so it's entirely possible that the parents got on one and the okay. kids were on another. But yeah, it's 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 just not tight. That's the whole problem here. Yeah. Is that so, you can easily so you're poke telling holes in me, all of it, right? That this woman knows her children are going on a flight with, uh, you know, her either her in laws or her brother or sister, whoever mm-hmm. the sibling, whoever the aunt and uncle are related to, and she didn't like say to them the night before, okay. You're the one taking care of my kid as you're traveling across an ocean. So, like, this I never mean, came up and said, hey, you're responsible for my kid tomorrow. I don't know. I don't know it's just bigger, weird. Bigger question for me here is, I feel like any other reasonable family would all collectively go to the airport simultaneously, yes. get checked in, and then they split up at the gate. And say, okay, here's my flight. I'm leaving. Your flight's in two hours. It's over there. Have a nice one. <laughs> <laughs> that's also a good point that's a good point yeah. it's just 
It's a, it's a big thing to swallow. I mean, I appreciate that they at least tried to give us a reason, because it's not like everything in Home Alone 1 and 2 is... You know, we, we pointed them out when we talked about it. There's some things that are like, mm. hey, that feels like you're fudging what reality would actually do in that situation. You know, the idea of Kevin right. being let on the plane and so on and so on. But they give you so many details to try and make it work that you're like, you know what, at a certain point, I'm going to let you away with the thing that I know wouldn't l- be allowed to happen. I'll, I'll let it right. go because everything else is so put together that you'll give, I'll give you it. Uh, whereas mm. this felt a little bit sloppier in comparison. Uh, yeah that's I mean, it though was... like if the rest of the movie was really good and entertaining i wouldn't really be that hung up on this but you know we're here yeah. we're talking about it so i always when it comes down to the suspension of disbelief stuff like that i always like to think of it in terms of apocalypse movies like you you know there's a giant wave or something like that or there's a cold front that's gonna arctic freeze everything you can easily point out and say <laughs> ghostbusters but... afterlife too and cinemas yeah, in March. there you go <laughs> um, but you can easily just look out the window and be like, there's no giant wave. You're making that up. I, I can't believe that. And obviously that's the sort of stuff that you just got to let go because that's the plot for the movie. You just need to let it happen. However, then you get things like Moonfall and stuff like that. <laughs> like the really insane ones that stretch that disbelief to the point of like, okay, but you haven't given me a good enough reason that this thing is happening in the first place. And that's where that line is and i think this is more in the second category where they mm. haven't covered their bases enough to make it something that i can believe in the reality that they've even set up so eventually max wakes up there's mm. no one there and he did wish to have an empty house he wanted the empty house because mm-hmm. he hates all of his cousins yep. and we get an insane montage and i say insane because you know in the first time alone like kevin did that one big scene uh, where he took a sled down the stairs and the movie mm-hmm. sort of like stopped and like built up to it and it was like oh he's teetering over the edge and it's like he's not meant to be doing this but that's kind of the point mm-hmm. and it's like okay then he goes down and it's like a whole thing this movie does a montage where he does like 10 things like that and like the space of a minute uh and then mixes in some really weird stuff like well you know how in the first movie kevin had the big pile of ice cream well mm-hmm. This time, they're going to parody Scarface <laughs> by having him dressed as Tony Montana and instead of having a mountain of cocaine, he's got a mountain of candy and he's putting, uh, you know, canned cream in his mouth and then yep. he sort of sits there as if he's high on cream. And all I could think was, okay, I feel like conceptually, I can see the humour in this mirroring a famous movie scene like a scene from Scarface with something mm. that isn't cocaine, right? I get I get the joke there. Yeah. But like they've went to the, the difficulty of having him being dressed in the exact same outfit of as Tony Montana. And that's mm. the point where I'm like, okay, this is just a reference rather than a scene that's having a fun reference in it, if that makes sense. Yeah. It also is the weird sort of thing where obviously in the originals we had Kevin you know reenacting things he had seen before he was watching these tapes and he was saying stuff from angels with filthy souls whereas in this one he's not max isn't able to get online he doesn't know what scarface is there's no reason to believe he's ever seen scarface which means that this entire thing is a reenactment just by sheer happenstance yes just for the adults who are watching this who have grown up who watched the original home alone we're going to reference Scarface because you're all old enough to have seen it now. <laughs> and I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, I guess. Which speaking so, speaking of Angel with Filthy Souls, though, we yeah, get a we'll glimpse. Get to that. We get a glimpse of the remake of Angel with Filthy Souls. God. We see them watching some weird cheap sci-fi movie where mm. it's like they're on a space station, but they're doing all the dialogue from Angel with Filthy Souls, and then like the douchebag like uncle character, not of this family, of the main family, uh, you know, so Jeff's brother. <laughs> says yes. ah they, ugh, these stupid remakes they, they're never as good as the original and he turns it off and i'm like don't be meta that yeah. way because you're just pointing out what i feel about this movie movie <laughs> yeah no that's the problem is if it's if you point out something you're getting the audience to think about it and just because you point it out doesn't mean you're immune to it <sighs> yeah. um the one thing i did want to say though about the montage scene yeah is like you were saying it, the first movie really built up to that sled going out the door thing because, you know, that was a big fun moment in that yeah. moment. And but, it was like and it was like he was a little scared in the moment. Like, Is this going to work? <laughs> Whereas here, he surfs down the stairs with an iron board upside down. Mm-hmm. 
Well, here's the reason that I think that this entire montage happens as co compared, and you know, it's so fast paced, nothing really builds up. It's because this is the only time he does anything. For the entire rest of the movie, because he is more of a secondary character compared to our bandits, he doesn't do anything that's like, oh, I don't go out and get groceries. I don't uh, make phone calls. I don't do anything. This is it. This entire montage is all of the stuff where he does his home alone stuff. That's it. Yeah, all in the traps, obviously. That's the all one in the thing. Traps, yeah. yeah. But... That's the one thing. Yeah. So meanwhile, uh, Max, or sorry, Jeff mm -hmm. couldn't find the doll. He thinks the kid stole it. So because, and it does this thing where, you remember in the first movie where Kevin's thinking and you hear the little flashbacks and the little like, bubbles mm -hmm. on the screen? It does it twice in this movie. I'll get to the other one later. But yeah. here, it does it for Jeff and he, he hears the conversation where awkwardly, and it makes sense why now <laughs> for the movie's sake, uh, Max and his mum said their full names to each other because it, like she gets angry and she's like, Max something Mercer, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And he's like, Carol something Mercer. So, so okay, he's got their full names. That means he can probably find where they live. So Max, the next day, tries to... And he doesn't try to go to do anything bad. He just goes over to try and say hello to the mum and say, hey, I think your kid took my doll. Mm -hmm. Can I have it back? Yada, yada. But, uh, and what he finds, of course, is the second wave of the family all rushing into their cars to go to the airport. And there's some yep. jokes where they think he's a driver or something. Yeah, he's an Uber driver. Whatever. Um, and But of course, when he's when they're doing all this, he sees them put a key under the like the, the plant pot and he, he hears them say the code because the uncle's like, hey, someone who lives here, what's the alarm code? And the daughter's like, oh, it's 1112. And he's like, that's a terrible code. So then they leave. He looks in the window and he sees like the kid's jacket and it looks like the doll's in the pocket. You don't see it, of course. Mm -hmm. You just see like a lump but it's yeah. vaguely sized to be the shape of the doll. And he's like, oh, I know where a key is, and I know the alarm code. Hmm. I could just pop in and take what's mine back. I'm not doing anything yeah. too wrong. Which, again, that doesn't, like, obviously he's very scared about doing it, but at this point, he's still 100% on the audience's side. Like, there, he has not done anything to yeah. say, like, oh, no, this is morally indefensible. It's like, no. Nah. That's your thing that this kid stole, and it's just right there. Go for it. Especially with how rude the entire family was being to oh, him. Yeah. Like, you're on Jeff's side. Yeah, you're absolutely on his side. And they do this, this little thing where he thinks he hears a police siren, and he turns around, and he thinks he's a cop car. But then mm -hmm. he sort of, like, you know, shakes his head a little bit. And it's actually just a car that's got, like, stuff, like, you know, like, luggage and stuff strapped on top. And there's a red and yeah. blue like suitcase that's sort of where the lights would be on a cop car i was like okay that's kind of cute that's not a bad idea it's like this idea that he has got a conscience and he knows this is technically wrong even though he's not going to go and steal whatever he wants he's just going to go take yeah. what belongs to him back and just you know yeah. he'll put the alarm back on he'll lock the door he'll put the key back where he found it and you know relatively speaking you know we're kind of on his side and yeah, you know it's going to escalate. This is this is not like in we've not done Jingle all the way yet, but we'll definitely do it at some point. I have many things mm -hmm. to say about <laughs> Jingle all the way, the Christmas classic. But that movie is all about okay, Arnold needs to get this toy for his kid, and it starts off normal, and it increases in the hijinks as the movie goes on. They do more mm -hmm. extreme things. He does things that are kind of unlikable, and he realizes that he's kind of becoming a dick to try and get this thing. And it's about you know realizing what's important, blah 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 blah. But there's a scene in that that movie where he breaks into his neighbor's house to steal a toy from under the neighbor's tree, and he decides not to do it. And that's like a big moment. He's like, oh, you know, I can't. I'm stealing from a kid. I can't do this. And he puts it back. But then he gets caught anyway, so he still gets all the comeuppance and whatnot. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. this to me is like we're way more on Jeff's side here for this because all he's doing is taking back something that belongs to him. And yeah, okay. Near the end of the movie, we find out that Max never took the doll. It was a misunderstanding. Right. But up until that point, I think the audience, we do think, as far as we know, he took it. So I'm like, you know, this is kind of a weird flip where the kid's the villain. And I'm on the yeah. side of these two because they're the ones who need to save their house. This kid stole mm -hmm. something from them. It's rightfully theirs. To a point, I'm kind of rooting for them. Yeah, no. So it's It's the thing where this movie has done everything in its power to get you onto Jeff's side. We see, you know, money problems. At this point, we've already had... I th no, it actually was later than that, um, where the douchebag brother gets introduced with his family. 
And it's um, a little bit after this, yeah. Yeah, but like we we oh, get no, this no, idea. It's not, you know. it's not. It's the night is before it? because they're they're at the the sleigh bells things that he does because he, he's late for his sleigh bells performance at oh, the old folks' right. home, yeah. and the brothers are so, already there for that. So yeah, we got introduced to his douchebag brother, who's like super rich, and his wife and kid are like able to get whatever they want. Yeah, the, the, teaching their the, kids the wife Spanish. is like insisting on high heels, even though it's inappropriate weather because it's all snow, and she's like yeah. hobbling up the 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 icy pathway up to the house and they arrive yeah. in the middle of the night because they wanted to beat all the like the storm and the traffic and stuff and of course they don't call ahead they think it's fun to surprise them not understanding how much and they're I, being put out by this somehow and we never see that they actually offer but they take the main couple's bed and jeff and yeah. pam sleep on the fold-out couch they, i don't think they opt well because the original thing was uh the brother said hey where do you have a set up? And he said, oh, you're on the pullout couch. And then the brother's like, ha, that's funny. And then just goes in anyway, <laughs> assuming that he's getting the main room. So yeah, but no, uh, all of that is just to get us on Jeff's side. Meanwhile, in Max's side, we've seen him essentially be this snarky kid to Jeff. We think that he's stolen his thing. And then the only thing we get to like kind of be on Max's side is that his family is kind of douchey to him. But even then, he like that's not enough. He still stole this thing, as far as the audience is aware. So we're yeah. on Jeff's side when it comes down to him going in and getting this toy. So, and I don't think the movie ever really undoes that in any way. It's only furthering how much we want Jeff and uh, Pam Pam to succeed. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Her name's Pam because she kind of became the second Pam on The Office. Yeah. It's, in my mind, it's just going to be Ellie Kemper. Yeah. Like, I think they say Pam like maybe three times over the movie, but it's just Ellie Kemper. Yeah, they say Jeff a lot. Jeff's name gets uttered a mm. ton. Yeah. But anyway, uh, but he does go in the door. He goes to put in the code. Uh, but he, or, No, no, that's the next night. He walks away at this point. It's when well, he comes not, back with Ellie. He does unlock the door, though, because that's when he sort of chickens out. Is he, he puts the key yeah. in, he turns it, and he goes, no, 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 I, I can't. And he puts it back. Yeah. Um, and then he runs to the, the they're doing a performance of the sleigh bells or whatever at the uh, mm-hmm. the old folks home and basically any time the family's got a thing on we have the brother and the, the, the sister-in-law character with their kid to basically just give like snarky commentary or like them reacting uh, if I, I'll, I'll just say what I thought was funny at the end um, mm-hmm. there's a slow motion bit at the end when they're diving to save the doll yeah. and both uh, Jeff and Pam uh, are basically like like get their hands in the faces of the brother-in-law and the or the brother and the sister-in-law and mm-hmm. that i actually i thought was kind of funny like i actually laughed because they've done they've done such a good job of setting up these two rich asshole like siblings throughout mm-hmm. the movie that them just pushing them out the way to rescue this doll i thought was a little amusing uh and just in case you didn't like them already right or you didn't like you didn't hate them enough after this mm-hmm. there's a little moment where the the, the sister-in-law leans over and goes Oh, I'm so happy they're not poor anymore. It was very awkward. Yes, so awkward. Yeah, I. I just I get. I'm bringing up that now because now we don't have to ever mention the brother or sister-in-law ever again. <laughs> That's fine. If we're not going to mention them again, though, I do want to just point out. I get the idea of you want this family to have money troubles. You want that to be a thing that they're worried about, and that makes it all the more redeemable for them to want to get this doll back. However. <sighs> If you're going to have the counter to that be the rich family members to make it seem like that much more of a thing, I think they needed more comeuppance in the end. Yeah. I think they needed there to be much more than just especially, a hand in the face. Especially since they kept buying the kids the expensive presents, which were mm-hmm. making the main two characters look bad. And yeah. I was like, how about instead of buying smartwatches for the kids, you offer to help them out? with some money for a couple months or yeah. something I, 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 and even, <laughs> even then it's it, if you got to get them christmas presents that's fine get them christmas presents but like talk to the parents just find out what the budget here is so you're not doing some wild crazy you know watches or dresses and stuff yeah. like how that. about instead of spending a few grand on the presents say hey would you like a few grand to help with the bills for a couple months while you're yeah. looking for a job I, you know i, I just just it's also idea. the also the counterpoint that we keep on seeing the kids get presents, but we never see anything given to Jeff or True. Pam. True. Not a single thing. They, so. they want to be the fun aunt and uncle that the kids love, but they, they mm-hmm. don't want to give them anything. Also, I'll just put out there, at the very end of this, we discover that the doll is obviously not with Max, and the their son, the uh, douchebag son, has it. Yeah, so the nephew, did, we'll did, call him. <laughs> did the nephew steal it? 
did the nephew have it this whole time? Well, no, he couldn't have, because he wasn't there yet. Right. Where did this doll go? It was just misplaced, I guess. Uh, Jeff just was an idiot <laughs> and couldn't I find guess. it. And then... I just... I, I, as soon as it came down to be that it was obvious that Max didn't have it, which happens before the reveal, but it's still at a certain point, I thought for sure that the comeuppance for the douchebags was going to be that they took this doll to sell because it belonged to the Jeff's mother. So obviously the brother would know about it as well. Mm. And it turns out that they aren't actually as rich as they're faking being. And they're kind of relying on this doll to get some money back. That's what I thought it was all building to. Turns out I was wrong, but that's where I was going. Well, what I love is, is that when the nephew walks out with it in his hand and like Jeff stands up slowly, everyone looks around at the kid and the kid Mm. for no reason decides to just throw it into the air. So we get the yeah. slow motion scene of Jeff and, and Pam. Like, you know, like, I think Jeff, like, puts his foot into his brother's face where Pam puts her hand into the sister-in-law's face and they're just mm-hmm. diving to get it and they, they, they fail. And a lot happens while this doll's falling. Like, if you think about how much things happen in slow motion while this thing's falling down, oh, like, yeah. they dive and fail and then Max has time to be the savior because he's here by this point and he dives and saves it. So it's like, oh, that well, like, that makes sense. He saves it. So they're yeah. all happy together, blah, blah. But anyway, we'll get to the end <laughs> yeah, a bit. we'll get there. We've got other stuff to talk about here because Jeff tells Pam everything that's went on, right? That this doll's mm-hmm. worth a lot of money. And Pam's initial response is, well... No one's there. It's not like anything's going to happen to it until they get back. We'll just go when they're back from their trip. Mm-hmm. No big deal. And he's like, no, no, we have to get it. It's too, it's too risky. It's too too blah, blah, blah. We, we have to go and get it. And we need this money now. And the motivation for, for Pam, this is the Somewhere in My Memory, like where they actually get the lyrics to the song. Yeah. And she walks into the main room of the home that night and she looks around and she sort of gets like a flashback to when they first moved into the house and she was pregnant. And it's like, somewhere in my memory. And she basically says something like, oh, like, you know, we're, we're not, we're, we're, we're not losing this. Be- we're not, we're not having the worst Christmas ever because of that ugly little boy. And then mm-hmm. her son thinks she's talking about him. And the sister-in-law says, I think you're quite handsome. And yeah. I was like, it's weird that Pam didn't say, oh, I'm not talking about you, honey. <laughs> like, it's weird she didn't say something with like that. This kid yeah. now is just going to grow up with a complex that he's an ugly child. I mean, that's why him and Max bond yes. later on. They, they do. both they got do. that same sort of issue. They do bond. You're quite right. Yeah. So they go... It's like, hey, did your mom say you're ugly too? It's like, no, your mom said I was ugly too. <laughs> wow. So they go to the house and they go inside... Uh, although Jeff, mm-hmm. again, is a bit of an idiot and he misremembers the alarm code. So he, he puts mm-hmm. in the wrong digits. And of course, Max wakes up and he's looking down the stairs and he's like, what the hell's going on? And he sees like, you know, he sees flashlights moving around and whatever. And they're whispering to each other. And this is where I think either when they're in or maybe it's when they're outside, but he mishears them talking about getting the doll back. And he thinks mm-hmm. they're talking about kidnapping him uh, for two reasons. One, because he says something like, oh, we get that ugly boy and, you know, some old woman will pay 200 grand for it and yeah. you know, she'll put him in like a room for the rest of his life and then Max imagines being like kidnapped by an old granny and being forced to sit at tea parties for the rest of his life mm. and it also links back to something that Jeff said to Max uh, Jeff cracked a stupid joke when he saw him earlier on in the movie where he said mm. oh maybe they're worth a few thousand dollars but I got much more for my real kids haha <laughs> Uh, so yeah. it set up a little seed of doubt for Max that this guy actually might sell real children. So that's why he's then scared of them for the rest of the movie, is that he thinks they're coming mm-hmm. to kidnap him, to enslave him, and ship him off to someone for a price. Yep. And then on the Jeff and Pam side of things, they they basically have an Alexa in the house, and Max says, call the police, and the thing, it, for whatever reason they set up earlier, is set to German. So it starts speaking in German, <laughs> Although, and they're like, oh, oh no, so a, a grandmother must be home. Yes. We gotta go. Who's, who's German? And that also yeah. feeds back to earlier on, because uh, Max's mom threatened, to, hey, you, you won't come on the trip, I'll leave you with grandmother. So mm-hmm. Jeff, you know, doesn't make a, an absurd assumption that the grandmother's the one staying with him here. Yep. And they think the grandmother's German. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's a lot of, that was a lot of details to throw together there. It was, but yeah. like... It's all, it, each of these things is set up, but it's only set up specifically for 
this one payoff. Yeah. Like it's just to get the plot moving at one point later on. It's not this overarching thing that keeps the movie afloat. It's just how do we explain the fact that when they get into the house the second time, they don't immediately start searching the house. And the answer is, oh, because of this Alexa thing that was set up German and this grandma line that was thrown away before. Can, can and... I just say that this uh, German thing with the with the Alexa knockoff mm -hmm. is that he literally says, how do I get you to speak English? And then it just goes switching to English. And I'm like, wait, no one tried that. Seriously? No, no one just said switch to English. And oh, anyway. I also love the point where uh, in that same scene, he's, goes to bed and he says good night home bot and it says good night max and i'm like how in the hell is that thing able to recognize that this is max it's the least of the movie's problems i'm not gonna fair. i'm not yeah, gonna yeah, dwell on fair. it <laughs> you're right yeah i mean you're absolutely right but i'm gonna yeah. dwell on it um so they run away uh well they try to run away and the police show up not because of max just because of the alarm and this is where so remember how i said earlier on there was a sign out front <sighs> saying yep. McAllister security and I thought oh that's a neat little callback <sighs> this police officer is Buzz McAllister and it is the actor and I recognized mm -hmm. him just purely because we've been doing these movies and I've had the IMDB pages open and I yeah. know what he looks like as an adult because of his photo on IMDB I'm like oh wait this is actually him this is Buzz McAllister and the camera mm -hmm. focuses on the name McAllister on his jacket on his badge or whatever and he starts asking questions and they just kind of bluff their way out by saying, oh yeah, my husband forgot the code because it's our anniversary. And then mm -hmm. she basically flirts with him and says, hey, if I wasn't married, a uh, strapping young police officer like you, I'd be way into you. And he yep. falls hook, line, and sinker for this. Like, he is all about it. I mean, Buzz was never the brightest, so he it wasn't, fits in character. No. So he just kind of... You know, that, that that ends. And I'll just, it's a couple of scenes later, but I'll mention the follow-up to this. Well, we have well, to. Can, that's fine. But I just want to point out, as soon as the scene ends and he drives away and he lets them go, all I can think is, I'm glad that was it. I'm glad <laughs> that's the most we're going back and we're we're calling back to the original. We're just making it one character. We're saying it's still in the same universe, but it's just one character from the original shows up and we don't have to ride that horse until it dies. Well, once Maxie's mom is aware that he's been left home alone in Japan, mm -hmm. she calls the police officer or gets someone to call the police and ask them to go check out that there's a kid been left home alone. And would you believe it when they call a squad car to go and check on the house? It's Buzz, who for some reason, mm -hmm. this entire scene is really disgustingly eating a burrito or whatever it is he's eating. And there's That's just, just Buzz. The scene ends with like some of it falling onto his coat and it's like really emphasizing on it. It's disgusting. But mm -hmm. he's told to go check out this house because a kid's been left home alone. And Buzz <laughs> responds with, ignore that it's a prank call and i'm like wait a minute buzz wait a minute wait just a minute buzz that's literally happened to your family mm -hmm. so what were you talking about and then he says it's just my brother kevin when we were young he got left home alone twice so every year to prank me he puts in a fake call about a kid being left home alone and i was there earlier tonight and do you think it's a coincidence that it's McAllister security at that house because it ain't and then, in fact, no, the exact phrase he used was, uh, I don't think so, because that was a line that Buzz had in the original. And if yeah. that wasn't enough, after he hangs up the, well, it's not a phone call, so it's the police radio, but after he's done Dispatch, with the call, yeah. he uh, says, nice try, Kevin, you little trout sniffer. He quotes himself from the first movie twice in this scene. Can I, uh, I mean, the quote is bad. I'm not going to say it's not. The part that gets me, though, is that it's, you know, they said, yeah, you know, Kevin, he's made his life career choice that he now does home security. That's great. I'm OK with that enough. But he decides that he wants to mess with Buzz every year and prank him on Christmas. Also, I can accept that. That seems like the kind of relationship they got, even as they grow up. No problem. But the prank is calling in a fake police <laughs> call every year, Which, and they just let that slide? Yeah, last time I checked, a prank call to the police was a criminal act. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's a little unforgivable. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, this is just so we can have someone a reference the first movie a lot, um, and then also mention Kevin specifically. Actually, bring him up. Yep. So, which I will say uh, trivia for this, they did at least request uh, Macaulay Culkin come back, mm-hmm. reprise his role as Kevin. However, that would have been, but he declined it pretty straight out, saying no. Why would I ever come back to that? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, credit to. Him. I wouldn't have blamed him if he took the paycheck because I, yeah. I could see them like setting up with Buzz, and then at the end, the head of McAllister Security comes down to check why there's such weird readings coming from this house, and then mm. he like sees all the traps and goes, "Uh huh, I know what's going on here." <laughs> Not again. Yeah. And he puts his hands on his cheeks. <laughs> oh no! But the nephew does that at the end for no reason. Oh yeah, that's the, the, one, right. the one who throws the doll. He just sort of smiles and does the face for absolutely yeah. no reason. He just does it. The little shit. <sighs> anyway, what happens next? I can't even remember at this point. Okay, so they go away, and their plan is to come back. But the next day, they have to go to church. And would, it, would you believe it? Their teen daughter is singing the exact same song that was being sung, and I think it was the first movie when Kevin went to church. Yeah. Uh, if not, it was the scene from Home Alone 2 when Kevin's in the choir. One of those two scenes, he was. it was that same song. It was the same choir song. I think it was the first one, yeah. but yeah, it might have been second. Yeah. In fact, it's the same church as the first movie. Is it? Yeah, the exterior, the little Bethlehem thing, the nativity scene, is in the exact same place. It looks the same. It may not, they may not have fil- filmed at the same building, but the implication right. is that this is the yeah, same no. church from Home Alone 1. Im- implication, that makes sense. I didn't think it was the same exterior, though. It looks similar yeah, enough, uh, but, I mean, people can tell me. I mean, it's not out of yeah. the realm of possibility. I know they shot it in Canada, because I saw a Quebec tax credit mm. thing at the end, so I yeah. assume I assume most of it's... Which is good for snow. If you're shooting a movie with snow, Canada's a pretty good place to go for it. Yeah. So. Oh, that's also one thing I wanted to bring up, is that they keep on mentioning this idea of snowmageddon or snowpocalypse is going on. There's like a little bit of snow at the start of Act 3. It's like barely a flurry, (laughs) and then by the time the buzz gets there, there's nothing coming down at all. I'm like, all right, good job, guys. Continuity's on point. (sighs) So they're sitting in the crowd watching their daughter sing. (laughs) And Keenan Thompson shows up again, and there's like a running gag where they keep lying to the kids about who Keenan is because they don't want them to know that they're selling the house. So they keep pretending right. that he's like a fitness trainer, and like the kids know something's up, but they don't really, you know, they're like yeah. whatever. Um, but the other thing about this church is that there's like a like a, a toy drive for for you know the poor children, right? Where mm-hmm. you can and the, you know the, the main family have got their son. And the son, like the daughter at least has the whole thing where she wants this dress and the parents think it's maybe a little revealing. Like, that's like the extent of her character. That's more mm. than the son gets. The son gets, you're given a toy to the charity part of the church for Christmas and that's it. But he bumps yeah. into Max. Max is there giving something. Well, actually, no. Max isn't there to give something. Max goes in and says to the woman running the charity, have you got a shopping cart for me? He thinks he can just take whatever he wants. Like, here's here's the thing. I know that because it's... it's I, I'm able to see Max's family. He's moderately well off. Not, mm-hmm. you know, extremely so. But decently enough. But just because he has a British accent... It makes him sound so posh compared to mm. everyone else there. So he walks in and he's asking for a shopping cart full of like to fill up on toys. Not only would that be an unreasonable request for any American kid, but because he has that British accent, he just seems that extra bit little douchey. <laughs> where he's like, "Oh, I'm going to take all of it. it's just Baruka salt from the freaking Willy Wonka movie." It's like, oh, I'm going to take all these toys home now. And he's slightly disappointed. And then when he talks to Jeff and Pam's son, and he's like, oh, I'm really sad because my parents are hiding something. They don't think we know mm. us, but we do. And then Max is like, but at least you've got your parents at Christmas. Mine aren't here, and I'm so alone. And I'm like, you're already at this point. You've had one montage, and like you you overheard like the, yeah. the couple outside briefly, and that's it. That's, that's where you are right now. That You've had not enough development. Yep. But Jeff and Pam notice that Max is there and they see him talking to the woman that's running the charity thing and say, oh, that must be the grandmother. They're both here. That means the house is empty. So they ditch mm-hmm. the, the, the church choir and they run to the car. They speed to the house. 
And then the entire plan to check the house while they're not at home goes completely out the window because when they get to the street, oh shit, there's like other families around. There's like a FedEx driver. The, the street's yeah. too hot. That's that's uh, you wait till like after dark. And I'm like, but they'll be home by then. The whole point yeah. was to come when they're not here. Absolutely defeats the purpose of it. But even then, the next sequence doesn't even require them to have waited. They just pull the car around onto like a back street. And then they jump the fence behind, which leads to, I don't want to say the least funny sequence that's supposed to be funny, but well, like, it goes on for way too long. I mean, there's a, there's a fart joke in it. And that's, that's, I stand by what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I'm agreeing with you, but I'm saying yeah. that's the, that's the main, my, that's my diagnosis of why it's yeah. painfully unfunny. Uh, yeah. They, they go around back and they, they're like, why is the wall so high? The, the, whatever that's try and i actually there was a split second here because ellie kemper says hey jeff i'll give you a boost and i went wait why are you giving him a boost he weighs more than you do and mm. then she says then you can pull me up and i went oh, okay all right okay the idea is that he's going to be stronger so he can lift you up from the top oh, okay right. okay mm. that does make some sense but we get a lot of slapstick here where he ends up on her shoulders and they're slamming into the wall and his pants come down he farts on her face and then eventually the, the punchline to this is that if you look just, you know, 10 feet to the left, there's a gate that they can just open. So she just walks in after Jeff's already fallen over into a toy, uh, like, dollhouse sort of playhouse thing. Yeah. Which, fine, whatever. I guess that's kind of a reference to two. Is, is, is it? I think it's just kind of, yeah. how do you wrap up this scene? And the answer is, he's got to land on something. I mean, it could have been a dog. It could have been anything. It could be a dog house. Yeah. It could be whatever. But they, they chose this type of house. It may be a reference to two when they're in the toy store and sticking their heads out the window. Hmm. Uh, so they're sneaking up. You see Max inside. And then they get to the door. They open the back door to this house. They take a couple steps in. And then notice that a family of, like, eight people it's a black family who mm -hmm. somehow don't notice that two random middle-aged white people have just stepped into the house and then they slowly back out without anyone noticing and the only person who notices anything in this entire thing is one of the small kids in the family notices out the window that they're falling into the the frozen pool because uh, yeah. they're walking on the cover of the pool not realizing that it's a pool and then it the cover starts to collapse yeah. yeah so uh, so they're freezing cold they're wet blah mm -hmm. blah blah and then this is the second time in the movie where they're walking like back to their car and she wants to go in right now and he's like no no let's wait till midnight so this is kind of the equivalent of the we'll come back at 8 p.m right right and max hears all this from his balcony we'll come back we'll get him and some of the things they say again from his perspective sound like an even more nefarious version of the kidnapping plot mm -hmm. and that's that's it right so and then we get they drive back to their family and we get the whole thing of them just having to pass the time on christmas eve to get to the point where which is the sister-in-law singing a awful christmas song <laughs> which fine enough fair but it's intercut with the setting up the trap scene yeah and the, the trap setup music starts on ellie kemper like drinking something in the kitchen and then it fades mm. to max starting his traps and i was like that was a weird choice but okay yeah but then we just, it's basically the time passing music at this point. It's not even setting up traps. It's just, hey, how do we show that we're doing things now? Mm. Um, so yeah, they, he sets up all the traps and we do get a giant like chalkboard wall that shows the gist of everything he's planning to do. And we get all the setup. The main thing that he has going for him is a bunch of like Nerf guns basically is his primary weapon of choice here yeah he's got like he three yeah he's, he's got one that he can like load with uh pill balls yeah it's a t-shirt cannon because his sister is a cheerleader apparently so yeah that's basically what okay. all the and then <laughs> random kitchen goods yeah the other and, thing. and obviously stuff like legos a lot of using water that'll freeze stuff uh mm -hmm. yeah he doesn't he doesn't just hose down the uh the front porch he goes like the whole street up until his house his entire driveway yeah the, the, is completely iced down the first the first trap is them in the car skidding on the ice like he could have killed mm -hmm. them <laughs> yeah so that's that's number a lot one. of these things could have killed them that is but... that is very true that's very true uh so they so the, the couple sneak out at midnight to go and get into the house to get their doll 
and mm -hmm. oh and then the other plan is that jeff's going to dress up as santa yes. because he thinks the kid will let santa inside which doesn't really come out of play that much to be honest he just happens to be dressed yeah. as santa from that point on but uh, so yeah this is where we get the traps they, they slide in the ice they do a little bit more with that you know the and the the path up to the steps where they're kind of like really struggling to get further up and they're sort of you know they, they, they go back and forward a little bit in attempts it's not just like one fall they do a little bit more yeah. hijinks and stuff with it which honestly it's probably like two and a half minutes of them just trying to get up this driveway it just takes too long That's and fair. there's like barely any falls to do oh. without it it's just them like struggling to stand the whole time this reminds me i was talking about music being used at inappropriate times the only mm. time the villain theme from Home Alone is used in this movie, for some reason, is when Buzz first appears, when he's getting out the cop car, and you hear that little theme. Oh, that's right. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Because I, I, I actually thought they were going to do a thing where it's like, oh, this is the equivalent of Joe Pesci. This is where the, this is where the movie's real villains are getting introduced. It's a corrupt yeah. cop. And eventually, I, the, the couple and the kid are going to team up to take on the real villains. I, I thought that's what they were going to do, just because of that music for a split second. I would love the draft of this movie of Pam, Jeff, and Max all teaming up to fight Buzz. That would be incredible. Yeah. It's just, he thinks that, like, Max, Pam, and Jeff all come to an understanding. They realize that it's, like, all just been one big misunderstanding between them. But then Buzz has it in his mind that these two are actually, like, dangerous criminals. And so they have to try to not get shot by this clearly undisciplined corrupt cop yeah it's uh there's potential there's potential mm -hmm. I, so i there, there like there's some things here that are kind of fun some of the early ones like um i'm not so they split up right kemper says she's going around back and mm -hmm. at this point they don't know that the kid's intentionally doing anything so i, I did think it was a bit strange that he kind of just sort of reveals that almost immediately with her by throwing yeah. things at her. But he's not throwing bricks. What he's throwing down is two liter bottles of soda with, um, what do you call it, put in it? The, uh, Mentos. Thank you, Mentos. And the idea is that they're, you know, they're like little rockets that are flying around. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of CG here. Um, it's a yeah. bit more, it's a, it's a bit more fantastical as far as the traps go and it makes it less fun, I think. Um, yeah. I, this is the one I was talking about where I just took me out of it because He's got like twelve bottles that he throws down one <laughs> at a time. <laughs> to, to be fair, I did slightly like the line when she says, mm. "Why do you have so much soda?" and he says, "My mom buys in bulk. It's financially responsible, or something like that." <laughs> yeah, that was a fine. I got line, a slight chuckle out of that. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, but it's sandwiched on all sides with these bottles are basically homing rockets. Yes. Like they are hitting her in the head stomach and legs constantly but then she goes over to a grill and goes full captain america with the lid to the grill starts hitting all the bottles away and mm. i'm like it's too much you cross the line that's it's it's no longer even feasible that it's, this is happening the interesting dynamic with these scenes is that both her and jeff when they see the kid are trying to say hey we're not we're not going to hurt you we're not here to hurt you we, we, like yeah. they're just and the thing is is to keep the movie going they have to have the kid stop them from ever just saying we want our doll and that's it like he has mm -hmm. to keep getting in the way of that so that, that we can't just wrap it up um uh with ellie kemper right after this uh the well i actually didn't mind the first like bottle explosion in her face because it wasn't as silly because it was just one bottle like spraying in her face and i yeah and i thought okay that's quite good because it, one it's, it's snowing and cold so she'll be freezing in the same way that water hitting her right now would be freezing but also mm. she'll be sticky right she'll be annoyingly mm. sticky and that sets up kind of the annoyance factor raising and the idea yeah. that as this goes on maybe they do get a little bit angry and they're never going to actually hurt them but they're, they're more determined to like get like to win kind of thing like there, you know. it's yeah it's going to be a thing where they stop trying to talk at all and yeah. they're just going to bum rush the house and say we're getting our thing and then we're leaving uh but she ends up uh getting her feet set in fire uh mm -hmm. and she goes to a, a tap uh like a faucet outside for a garden hose and turns it on but it's been rigged to spray in her face as opposed to down the way so she gets yeah. all cold from that she gets the fire out uh meanwhile and this is the, the part I, I like the least, really. Um, mm. I, don't get me wrong. 
I was slightly amused by how ludicrously big the lump on the forehead was when he gets hit. <clears throat> so he fires yeah. a golf, or not a golf ball, sorry, a, a pool ball at Jeff's head. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, for the rest of the, this segment of the movie, he's got this bulging, almost pool ball sized lump on the front yep. of his head, uh, which is comical. But after he gets knocked down by this, Max has this plan where he comes down and he is uh, put the VR headset on on Jeff. Mm. And I was thinking at this point, what's he going to do with this? Because, like, he'll know he's got a VR headset on, right? I'm sorry. He have should. you never used VR before? It's completely immersive. You <laughs> have no idea what reality is. <laughs> so, well... When you see it from his point of view, though, when Jeff wakes up, he sees, like, mm -hmm. the Grand Canyon or something. You know, he's like, he's on, like, a cliff face, and he's like, oh, I've got vertigo, and he's, like, literally, he's, he's legitimately scared, and he jumps mm -hmm. as if he's trying to leap over a crevice and, like, jumps into some shelving and gets, you know, hurt by doing that. And so the idea that he doesn't realize this is fake is, first of all, the thing that I really hated, but then yeah. what really irked me about it on top of that is that when he looks down at his body, he sees mm -hmm. the Santa outfit that he's wearing, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> VR does not detect what you're wearing and models your in-game body to match it. No. You know what's, we what's weird to me is I recognize that same thing, but for some reason I was just going to be like, all right, whatever. I was willing to let it go. Until for some reason, I don't know why this set me over, he looked at his hands and it showed his wedding ring was on, and I'm like, now that's too much detail. <laughs> that's just that's the thing that pushes me over. But yeah, no, I mean, it's it's just written as one of those ways of like, you know, don't think about how the tech actually works. Think about how we want it to work. I just, and it's it, not good. Like the physics of the, the bottles flying around like rockets was silly and stupid. But mm. this to me, him being convinced he was suddenly on a cliff was mm -hmm. like the the most absurd thing out of all these traps to me like i just could not suspend my disbelief that he would even remotely think that yeah it struck me as a sort of thing where you see these videos online of real people like america's funny Home video style of people wearing the vr headsets and then they go to jump for something and they end up colliding with a person it strikes me that someone saw that and was like hey i've been tasked to write the screenplay for home alone 6 i can work that in as a slapstick bit yeah, but they know they're wearing VR headsets. So they're not tricked. Like, they, yeah, they, obviously they do something stupid because they get maybe too drawn in. But the yeah. idea that he doesn't feel something on his head, and because oh, it's yeah. not like you don't feel the VR headset, like you still feel it. I'm not saying it was written in well. I'm just saying it was written in. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, then Ellie Kemper, when she gets up, uh, her hair's all sort of sticking up from the the water freezing that she got hit in the mm. face with, and she comes in. And one of the traps that I did like here, after she comes in and she actually bashes Jeff in the head with the door a bunch of times uh, yeah. by accident, not realizing that's what she's doing. But she goes into a room, and I did appreciate that they up, up the ante with the Lego by having the entire room floor covered in Lego. And she mm -hmm. takes a couple of steps in, and then she's she's hurt. She falls to her knees. Her knees are then hurt. And I appreciated the idea that, okay, she starts swimming through the Lego. She, she literally does the backstroke through the Lego to get yeah. through the room. I actually thought that was a cute idea. Yeah, because it works. It's a tiny thing everyone can associate with how much Lego hurts, and it's reasonable that this kid would have that much Lego. It's it's a perfectly suitable trap for the movie. I'm uh, glad they had it here. Yeah, or at the very least, he's got like at least one or two siblings. So I mean, between three kids, that's a lot of Lego. Yeah, if I, for sure. Probably my favorite part of the trap setting up is that he just grabs like it's like the London Bridge or something in Lego, and he just smashes it over his knee. And mm -hmm. I was like, all right, okay, he's. he's this is how he's setting up the traps. Okay, I I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, one trap we did skip over for Jeff right outside the front door was he made hot sauce infused cookies for Santa. Oh, yeah. Actually, I'm glad you're bringing this up. What is mm -hmm. it with this in the last movie's obsession with having the one of the traps be cooking based? I don't know. They just, everyone assumes that if you see fresh made cookies, you're going to eat them. Yeah, so the idea is that he's left out cookies for Santa with a note saying, sorry, Santa, I have to go to bed but these cookies are for you. Uh, but mm. he's put, like, ultra hot hot sauce in the chocolate mix. So yep. he obviously needs to take a drink of the milk. I didn't even see what he was putting in the milk, but he clearly didn't like that either. I think it was just more hot sauce. Was this more hot just, sauce? Fair yeah, enough. I think that's all it was. <laughs> all right, so he starts eating some snow to cool down his mouth. Uh, very mm -hmm. good. Um, 
we don't get paint cans. We do get some stuff swinging, though. We get, like, a bag of flour, a bag of... Uh, it's a carton of milk, I think. A carton of milk's one of them. And mm. then there's sort of the, the payoff to that joke is that he's like, this kid's turning me into a cookie. And Ellie Kemper goes, now nah, you need sugar for a cookie. And then cut to the kid with a slingshot with a big bag of sugar uh, yep. coming for him. All right. He also buttered up the stairs, so it's hard for them to get up, and they fall down. Like, that's the thing. Repeatedly. Between the driveway and the stairs... It's the same trap twice. They yeah. just have them keep doing it, but, and it's extended as well. Both these are really long sequences of them trying to stagger their way up to wherever they want to go. From a logical point of view, it's kind of like, yeah, slippy floors are, are going to keep being effective. Nothing's going to stop that from being effective. So I get why, logically, he should just keep making things slippy. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's a bit repetitive in case of a movie. Yeah, exactly. Uh... I yeah. mean, if you really wanted to be effective, then the answer here is board up the doors. Like, put stuff <laughs> in front of them. There you go. Successful. They don't get in. Uh, he has some of the few more, few more pool balls. Uh, mm. There's a more one of the more absurd ones here that I didn't like, because, it again, it felt like they were just messing with physics and switching to CG, is where Ellie Kemper gets hit with, like, the, the exercise ball, which doesn't mm -hmm. do anything, but then he, like, slingshots, uh, like, like, a a big, kettleball. like, a big weight, yeah. And that sends her flying down the stairs, uh, very absurdly, like the way she bounces around. I'm like, eh, nah. Yeah. Also, he drops a few like plate weights onto this treadmill beforehand, and the first one hits Ellie. Can't, she just, you know, takes it, no big deal. But then the second one, he ups the speed, and it flies right past her head and lodges itself into the door behind her. And that's the point where I'm like, oh, he's out for blood. He's going to kill these people before the end of the night. Because there is no way in hell that anyone was going to survive that plate weight to the head. I actually appreciate the first one hits her like awkwardly on the shin. It's not like it actually hits mm -hmm. her in the stomach or something. It's like, I don't know. I like that it's like more of like a really annoying pain than it is like a, yeah. a threatening one. But then yeah, you see, he, he turns the treadmill up to like a bigger speed and then it's like, oh, wait a minute. Now he's just trying to like, kill no, them. Yeah, you're going to die. This is how <laughs> this ends now. So they're chasing after him. Uh... The big sort of finale trap before the standoff where everything kind of cools down is that mm. Max goes off the balcony because he set up a trampoline. He lands in the trampoline and Jeff runs out to the balcony and Max goes, oh no, there's a ladder there next to the balcony. And Jeff's like, I'm not an idiot. And he just jumps like he did on a trampoline. But Max has got it rigged to pull away one of the legs. So it goes to an angle and when Jeff bounces, he bounces at an angle and, like, hits uh, a tree or something. I don't know. Hit, yeah. He hits something. Uh, something in the yard. So, Max had a tooth. Yeah. Uh, but the big thing that happens at the end is that they kind of have him cornered in the main room. And he's threatening with more pull balls and his t-shirt gun. Mm -hmm. And this is where it just like, kind of all comes out. Where he, he sort of says, are you not taking me to spend the rest of my life in some granny's, you know, tea room? And it's like, wait, what are you talking about? He's like, ah, I heard you. You want to kidnap me and sell me? You want to send the ugly child for two hundred thousand dollars? Like, what? Well, no, you're not. They said you were ugly. <laughs> you're not ugly. He's like, uh, well, my mom says I'm, I'm, I'm spirited. That's a character. Yes. Uh, and like, no, we just want the doll that you took. And he's like, I didn't take a doll. And then mm -hmm. I, I do appreciate that Jeff doesn't try and argue. He's, he, he sort of at this point is like, well, why would the kid lie now? Like after yeah. this chaos, where. Because this scene ends, after they've all made up and like, hey, you can come stay with us until your mum gets back, we'll t take care of you for a couple of days, blah blah. Mm -hmm. The chandelier falls and like, around them, and they all just are lucky that they survive by being in the holes of the chandelier. Yeah. And Max is like, okay, I know what this looks like, but this was actually an accident. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I appreciate it, because again, it makes it that sort of thing of he doesn't feel like he's in control of everything. Yes. Yes. And I appreciate that more than the idea of these omnipotent, all-knowing kids who know how everything's going to play out. And of course he's like, shit, I'm going to get in so much trouble. Look at this house. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, you probably are. It's like, no, no, your mom's just going to be happy to see you. And then you're going to get in trouble. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. You never actually, I mean, you, you do kind of get a reaction because after she comes, comes and picks up Max, after the whole slow motion thing with a doll, right? That all mm -hmm. happens. And then Max's mom shows up. Uh, there was a running joke, by the way, on the plane with the guy sitting next to her. Uh, yeah. Where the joke is, is that he keeps watching her screen, even though he's got his own screen in front of him, he keeps watching her screen. And 
she's bothered by this and asks him not to and he apologizes I... <laughs> and then just keeps doing it anyway I know that it's just because I haven't had like proper lunch today before recording <laughs> that my eye is currently twitching, but I like to think it's this scene because it's just so obnoxious. It's just two people basically without a script ad living off each other of just like, no, I, I, I think you should watch your screen and not mine. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it. Shut up. Just shut up. It's not even comedy at this point. And it's he's just sleeping an on her shoulder. And he's like, yeah. he's like sort of rubbing his nose into her shoulder as she looks uncomfortable. That's the, the running gag. Uh, but there's an epilogue scene. For the first time mm -hmm. in Home Alone history, it skips a mm -hmm. year later. And now both these families, and this is where you see Max's dad again, as well as his sister, uh, both families are having Christmas dinner together. Um, the 200 grand paid off for the, the, the mortgage, also paid for the replacement chandelier. <laughs> And, the, yeah, and, the other and house. some drywall and everything else that was broken. Which does be beg the question to me is like, okay, when you, like did did you and Max come up with a story that was a little less incriminating? Because it, it still sounds bad yeah, they, that you broke into the house. <laughs> well, at least for the douchebag brother, uh, they were they came up with the story of like he went over to get the doll, they crashed into a tree, and then he just walked in and found that Max was alone. Yes, he didn't mention any of the traps happened but i can't imagine what they told the mom like it has to have been the truth there's nothing else to justify all that damage if it wasn't the truth i mean maybe they made a deal with max and max would take blame for half of them just him being a crazy kid <laughs> yeah so just to just it's to like, lower it down anything that happened outside of your property you can say was us like the, the <laughs> car crashing in and breaking your sand that's fine but everything inside was you kid Otherwise, we're going to jail. <laughs> and your mom's going to jail for leaving you alone. Yep. <laughs> this is all one big collective conspiracy. We're all going down together. But no, apparently these two families are now the best of friends. Mm -hmm. And that's all happy. Somewhere in my memory, Home Alone 6 comes to a close. Ah, dear. I will give it credit. It has like 12 minutes of credits on Disney Plus, so it wrapped up a lot sooner than I thought it would. <laughs> yeah, actually, they got to the end of the traps and there was like 20 minutes left. And I went, wait, how much is it we having after the traps? This is weird. Mm -hmm. And then it's because, yeah, there's 12 minutes of credits. So it was only a little bit of an epilogue. But yep. yeah, it, like, as far like the overall quality is just. It's better than five and four for sure. There's a, for sure. There's a reasonable argument for three as well. Although. I think some of the things that this does that I hate are things that are particularly great to me right now in movies in general, which is the, the nostalgia mm. wanking, the just the kind of soulless, like this is content for a streaming service that has no real merit or weight. Right. Right. And I'm not saying Home Alone 3 had weight because it didn't, but it, it felt more earnest than what it was, at least, even if it was just a sequel. Yeah. I mean, if you just, I'm looking at the poster for the, thing right now the promotional image where the tagline to it is Ho holiday classics were meant to be broken like not only does it feel like a cash in on the nostalgia based off that but they understand the idea of like yeah we're not we're not your grandfather's home alone anymore we're, we're doing things different but then when you actually watch it it's the exact same feeling of content as you've been saying that has proliferated pretty much everything i've seen on disney plus it's been that exact same sort of feeling where it doesn't feel like it was made with purpose or intent it feels like it was made because we have a quarterly budget that we have to use up and we want to hit our marks yeah it just feels soulless and empty They're like there's mm -hmm. a couple of moments that gave me a chuckle but that is really the extent of what i can say there's there's yeah. no sense of momentum or stakes and I, i'm not saying i need you know the godfather here i'm i'm simply saying that if i compare it to home alone one which had good stakes for a family movie like it felt like kevin really what needed to defend his house he felt he needed to defend mm -hmm. his house and you had villains that were actual villains and well i think on paper i do like the concept of doing something very different where oh no the people breaking in are actually sympathetic and we can understand them um mm -hmm. it does also rob it of having villains that we can just root against and the kid gets really underdeveloped and we spend very little time with them in the grand scheme of things as a result. All of mm -hmm. these problems just mount up to a very kind of lackluster Home Alone movie. It's still better yeah. than 4 and 5 just because they were so bad that mm -hmm. this just having 
a little bit of production value and a couple of decent cast members goes a long way but yeah i mean i think the other biggest problem for me is i my sucker point the thing that i've always wanted out of these is to get that same feeling of just christmas joy that the first two gave this mm. idea of this this feel if you're gonna do the nostalgia wank it's so easy to tap into here's the feeling of christmas that you want to feel again ever since you were a child first two nailed that everything after that is missed and i think that if you're going to have these sympathetic villains these and i mean they're not even villains like you said but these sympathetic thieves then you can give them this story about the you know true meaning of christmas what's important stuff like that and they try they have this concept of we're going to sell our house and we have to sell it around christmas time and we're low on money and we have that whole section of ellie kemper with somewhere in my memory playing but then by the time you hit the end of the movie they say like oh no the real home is our family like that's what's important is that family is what's important but then they still decide oh but we don't want to sell the home like yeah we we care about our family and all but like we really like this house guys so guess it doesn't matter that home is where family is it also matters that home is where home is i also thought maybe max's like mom would be like hey we're fairly rich we can help you out a little bit which would also mm -hmm. make the the brother and sister-in-law look terrible that this practically set of strangers are going to help mm -hmm. them financially when, when they're not ponying up anything and keep flaunting how well off they are yeah oh, and dear. That's, that's kind of the thing that i dislike about it, is they're like there is no sense of Christmas joy here. There is no sense of helping out other people. You get this idea that everyone takes pity on Max when they find out that he is home alone, but it doesn't extend to anything outside of, okay, well, I'll just watch you until your mom gets here. Like, yeah. that's it. That's It's not this idea of like, oh no, you, you're home alone at Christmas. Come, stay at our home, spend the night. Like, yeah. no, he stays at the uh, Ellie Kemper's place for like maybe two hours, tops. Yeah, maybe... Um... Like something where, let's say the mom comes home and she's really mad at him for the house. Maybe you have Ellie Kemper and Jeff like jump in and defend them or something. Mm -hmm. Like you have them stick their necks out for him and maybe confess more than they need to 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 save his ass because that's the right thing to do. It's a sweet thing to do, and that's yeah. your Christmas thing. And then you have him maybe stick up for them and say, "No, they shouldn't be punished for this." Like yada yada yada. Um, even though. Yeah, obviously it turns out that Jeff was wrong. The kid never had the thing in the first place, which does... Mm -hmm. I, I almost don't like that reveal because it, like, like 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 we've been saying the whole movie, up until a certain point, you're kind of on their side that they should have this thing back. And mm -hmm. it's understandable that the, the flip of this being that he was wrong the whole time and Max never had it without there being another villain that took it. Because at least what you proposed earlier where the brother took it maybe secretly... That would yeah. have worked because it's like, okay, you're giving us another villain, though. So it was stolen. Jeff wasn't ridiculous for thinking it was stolen because it was stolen, in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. But the way it is in the movie, it's like, no, nah, it wasn't actually stolen, so he just looks like he's an idiot. And this entire yeah. thing does make him and his wife guilty because it was all done on an assumption that was wrong. Yeah. I mean, that's the... Because of the way this movie essentially evolved is that it robbed it of an inciting incident. The inciting incident is Max stole the doll. And then by the time we hit the end of it, it's not only that Max didn't steal the doll, nobody stole the doll. There was uh, no reason for anything to have happened in this movie yeah. outside of incompetence of Jeff. Honestly, Max having the doll, him stealing the doll, is an unlikable thing that he, at mm -hmm. the end of the movie, can choose to give it back when he realizes how important it is to, to Jeff and his family. Would be yeah. the Christmas moment for the kid. It'd be like, hey, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize this was important to you here like th this could be his here's your two turtle doves moment right it could have mm -hmm. totally worked as an ending for that story i think i think having it not be the kid that took it makes the kid less interesting as well because that was the only thing he had going for him really is that oh this is interesting that they made him do a bad thing to start off the story that was at least something and mm -hmm. by taking that away from him even makes max less of a character because now yeah. he's just Max had no change over the course of this movie. Like, yes, theoretically, the idea is that he didn't like being around his family, and then he learned by the end that yeah, he actually does that, like him. That arc happens between scenes, though. We don't get to see that arc, so that, right. I'm not counting that. <laughs> and even then, it doesn't seem like he even cares about his family as a whole, because by the end, the only one we see him spend any time with is his mom. 
Like the mom comes back and she's like, oh, well, we'll spend Christmas just together by ourselves. That'll be mm -hmm. okay. It's like, oh, okay. So it's just her. That's the only one you cared about. And in fairness, during the entire opening sequence, when we see how bad the family is, the only one he cared about at all was his mom. That was the only one that he was trying to get the attention of the entire time. So, yeah, yeah I didn't get a feeling that family was all that important to him at all. So, I, I do think revealing that Max never took it is a big problem because it was it's mm -hmm. such a simple thing to give it a happy ending that he did it and cho chooses to give it back. And it also means that he's grown as a character from taking it because he wanted it to mm -hmm. not. Instead, to do this thing in the epilogue where he asked for one of those like uh, energy drinks that he stole, because that, that's what it turned. It turns out that he did steal that. That was the thing yeah. that was in his pocket. He stole one of the drinks, mm -hmm. and he says, "Hey, can I have one of those, Jeff?" And gives him a look like, "If you don't, the 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 pill balls are coming back out." Yeah, <laughs> and I think that's Ellie Kemper chimes up. He's like, "You better give it to him. We all know what happened last time." <laughs> yeah, that was the thing, and because even then, even Max's mum starts laughing like, "Oh yes, my son will kill you." <laughs> property damage moving on <laughs> i was like that that gives me the impression you know what happened and it feels mm. weird that we're all okay with it but okay that's fine yeah i mean as long as to be fair if i wasn't around for something that like destroyed my home messed with my stuff and it wasn't anything that was irreplaceable that was damaged and then i got paid wholesale for it i'd be like all right well i guess that works out in the end yeah, I guess. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know. Please don't destroy my stuff, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get a big jar of slime, walk into mm -hmm. your comics collection, just start smearing the pages. Okay, some of those are irreplaceable <laughs> because I am not about to pay the money that's required to get it back. So Oh if, That's if, important. If if you ever got a copy of Hell Arisen issue three, oh that 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 issue. I have a copy of Hell Arisen issue three. <laughs> I bought that. That cost me forty bucks. Don't I, you dare touch that. I may not even touch anything else. I'll just take that one comic that I know you caused no. you great pain trying to secure. Heller is an issue three and Batman Elmer Fudd. Those are the <laughs> two that cost me nearly a hundred dollars combined. I'm gonna just walk outside and go to the mm. woods and use it mm. as toilet paper. It won't be very pleasant, but it's the symbolism that counts. It's for the message, damn it. <laughs> um it's about yeah, sending I... a message, to quote the Joker. All right, are we going to rate this? I wish should. What are All you right. rating? Home Alone. So, like you were saying, it's definitely better than 4 and 5. I don't think that's even really up for debate. In terms of comparing it to 3, that's a bit more up for debate. I think that is, depending on how you feel about the idea of, like, that whole super spy subplot and the chip and all that. Personally... I will, I will say this. Home uh -huh. Alone 3 still looked and felt like a movie yes. whereas this feels like it's made for a streaming service now i'm not saying that's a an overall like I, that, i'm not saying that overrides anything else that this might do better than that but i'm saying mm -hmm. it's definitely a factor in my head that makes this feel like it f feels weaker as a thing yeah technical quality i think three is probably better but i i just can't get over the super spy thieves <laughs> subplot like it's too much i, I would put that under i like this yeah movie i like still. ellie kemper and jeff more than i like the super spies from yeah three i'll say that i'll so, agree with that so all in all i think this one i'm gonna give it just barely above the midpoint i'm gonna say it's a 5.5 but that is that comes down to the idea of i think that there is a lot missing from this in terms of comedy beats landing i think there's a lot missing in terms of this idea of what home alone should be representative of but i do think that there are enough jokes that land and it's inoffensive for the most part it's just a little frustrating i think for us because we have been going through all of them and we just want the originals back that's yeah that's really what it comes down to oh dear yeah i'm just gonna go straight five i think uh, okay. which is more which is a higher rate than i gave three to be fair so i guess i'm mm -hmm. saying overall is better although there are some things that are better about three uh this one is is not as painful to watch certainly not as the last two yeah yeah i mean i've said everything i need to say really i, yeah. I it's 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 it, it's a five out of ten. It is it is the definition of a streaming service piece of content that you will forget yeah. and you won't care about, and no one will ever talk about 
like down the line the only way this will ever be talked about is if someone does what we've just done and decides mm-hmm. to go through the home alone series down the line and it'll be a footnote in that in the same way that us talking about four and five were just these weird footnotes it's yeah. like they did these so we have to talk about them because we're doing the whole series but that's the do only you, relevance they're ever going to have do you think that four is canon to this one because it involved <laughs> in the calendar still no, I think this is a, a Halloween H2O style thing where it's only mm. counting the first two movies. That's what I've Gotcha, thinking. gotcha. I'd, I'd love for Buzz to say specifically, like, yep, it's just me, Kevin, and my sister. No other siblings. Although, to be fair, there's absolutely nothing that rules out three and five. Oh, yeah, no, because it's totally separate families, but you can't yeah. get confirmation one way or the other. Yeah, three and five could have happened. They may not have happened. Who cares? No one gives a shit. <laughs> that nah. doesn't matter. Not at all. Um, as for making the cut, uh, it does. Well, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. It's just a simple answer. It doesn't. I mean, I think it's cut from the collection, bordering on cut, cutting it close. But I do think it's still cut. You cut from uh, yeah. the collection. No, I don't think it's cutting cutting it close. I, I think mm. it's easy to think you could call it that because it's a five out of ten, and that's in the middle. But mm. I don't think five out of ten is cutting it close. I think a six out of ten is more cutting it close. Because a five, if a 5 out of 10 is straight down the middle and it's completely and utterly mediocre, which is what I would say a 5 is, I don't think that is cutting the clue. I think that's just, no, you don't want a mediocre movie. I mean, I don't go based off the ratings. I just go off the general vibe. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, fair. I agree in the context of it. So, there you go. That's that. That is the Home Alone season done. That's Christmas season done for the year. Woo! Um, who knows what we'll do next Christmas. And there's always a chance we may not do a Christmas season if there's like... If there's a new movie out that ties into a mm. franchise or something that happens to release right before Christmas, there, there may be a year where we don't do a Christmas season. So, a year without Santa Claus? It's, it's possible. It's possible. Uh, but uh, So next up, the next season we're doing is we're returning mm. to what we started uh, this previous year with, and that is 70s Disasters. We're doing yep. the 70s Disaster Season 2. It's a bigger season. We're doing, we did five last time, and this time I think we're doing seven or eight. We're, we're, we're going all in. Something like that. We're yeah. getting most of the ones that are left done. We've got some big ones like Tower and Inferno and Earthquake. We've got some mm-hmm. ones that I had never heard of until I went looking for them, but they sound interesting. <laughs> there's a roller coaster movie. There's a, there's a movie about uh, other things. I can't remember what the other ones were. There's, there's, there's at least another ship one. There's another ship movie, at least. Yeah, there's avalanches in there, oh, cyclones there in there. Cyclone. That's a cyclone, damn it. Um, mm-hmm. So that's what's coming up next season, um, and yep. something that we're we're doing now between seasons is that between each season there'll be one week off, so there will not be an episode next week. That said, yep. though, we gave you two episodes a week for the last three weeks, so that's not really yeah. that big a deal in this case. <laughs> but it was a break. But going forward, uh, there will be one week off between each season, and this is to free up a little bit of time because now me and David are also doing uh, the Atomic Cinema Experiment as a pair. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's something else that's in our yep. schedule. And to try and help that along, because we're doing three episodes of that per month. Although, mm-hmm. much like the flexibility of Collector's Cut, sometimes we'll do more than that if there's a lot of new releases out. And there's like a period yep. next year where that seems to be the case. I was going to say, next few days, you guys are getting Rebel Moon, because that's a new release. Oh, don't remind me. We're recording yep. this in advance, but I am not looking forward to Zack Snyder's <laughs> new movie, okay? What? You're not looking forward to part one that we don't even know is going to work before we get part two? And it's a Netflix movie as well. Yep. None of it's good. All the boxes. All of them great. So yes. uh, So the the change going forward is that, and this is actually better than it was going to be. We we were originally going to do three episodes a month, a collector's Mm -hmm. cut going forward, and there's going to be gaps in between the seasons. And then we thought, you know what? It would be much neater and much nicer to only do gaps between the seasons. So that's what's yep. going to happen going forward. And so there's a week off, and then we'll have an a seven week or so 70s disaster season, mm-hmm. season two. And that'll basically wrap up all the 70s disaster movies, barring one or two odd entries that, you know, which maybe, will work elsewhere. Yeah, maybe we'll do some catch up with some like leftover 90s disasters or something down the line, whatever it may be. Yeah. But uh, that's the plan for the next little period so hopefully that sounds like fun we had a lot of fun doing the last batch uh, i, I like mm-hmm. doing those movies you know they weren't all amazing but i thought they were all interesting and it was fun seeing how they did different things across those five movies so if you haven't seen those five reviews and you haven't seen those movies i recommend go back check those movies out and watch the the reviews i, I think they were yeah. they were interesting uh but uh well that's what we're doing next so 
Yeah, you can, of course, uh, get extra episodes with me and David. We've got two bonus monthly shows that we do over on patreon.com slash TV. Uh, $3 and up, you get access to the Criterion Cut, where we review movies from the Criterion Collection one per month. It is, you know, the best of the best. It's prestigious. It's art house. It's foreign film. It's cinema, baby. <laughs> and then $5 and up, it gets the access also, in addition to Criterion Cut, you'll also get Extra Reels, which is the show where we review some of the worst of the worst ever made. Sometimes they're so yep. bad they're amazing, but not always the case. In fact, this month, uh, the episode mm. was A Talking Cat, which was David's favorite so far. So, You know, just last night, <laughs> um, I was showing my girl, she'd never seen Dark Knight. I'd never, <gasps> she, she'd never watched that. So I sat down, I showed it to her. And when Eric Roberts came up on screen, I said, hey, do you recognize that voice? <laughs> and she said, no. And I said, that, he was in Talking Cat. And she said, oh. Tell me he did that before he just started in this. And I was like, no. It was after. Eric Roberts has not had a good career. It, it's, it's been very wonky, very up and down. That man loves to work. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. He just keeps working. <laughs> yeah, wild stuff. But uh, yeah, did she like Dark Knight? She did. She did enjoy it. Good. So yeah. now I just got to get her Dark Knight Rises. Well, if she liked Dark Knight, it should be an easy time. Oh, yeah, it won't be a problem. No, uh, not at all. So there you go. That is... Uh, that's that's the sales pitch of course if you can't support us on patreon that's okay you know hit the like button helps out a lot if you do uh more people will find the show that way so hit the button uh and whatnot but that is us so thank you very much for joining us we always appreciate it keep watching movies and do, do you wonder if in home alone 2 they did the whole smelling fish joke as a reference to this trout sniffer line from the first movie the villains were in fact sniffing the trout when they were lost in New York. Happy New Year!